Cooler Master is well known for their cases, for their coolers and for their peripherals, but their adventures into the monitor market never really stood out as much. So they released a couple of models so far that were quite good, but they never really had interesting features and they were always on the expensive side until this one right here came out. So this is the Tempest the GP27U and it is a 27 inch gaming monitor with a fast IPS panel, 4K resolution, 160 Hertz refresh rate. It has mini LED backlight and a wide color gamut. So it should offer a great HDR experience and it comes with proper HDMI 2.1 connections. But the best part about this monitor is the price. So it should cost you around $800 in the US or around 900 euros here in Europe, which is a great price for these specs. So let's see how good it actually is and if it's worth getting at all. Let's go. This video is brought to you by Seasonic and their Prime TX power supplies. These fully modular, high quality power supplies are extremely efficient. They are very quiet due to their new hybrid fan control that stops the fans completely under 40% load. They offer a variety of connections for any kind of systems you have in mind. And you even get the new 12 volt high power connection you need for the brand new RTX 4090 graphics cards from Nvidia. They range from 650 watts all the way up to 1600 watts for the biggest enthusiasts out there. And as a nice bonus, you get a cozy 12 year long warranty. Check them out using the links in the description below. The GP27U comes with an excellent, well-built metal stand that is cleverly done in the shape of the Cooler Master logo. It might be a little bit bulky, but it is also very sturdy and it is very ergonomic. The monitor is height adjustable, you can tilt it, you can swivel it, you can rotate it 90 degrees, and if you prefer, you can even vase mount it. I do think the cable management is a little bit basic. Uh, one clip is not really enough to keep the cables completely out of sight, and I just wish they added at least a second clip there. There is a limited RGB feature on the back of the monitor, which looks kind of good, but it is also not bright enough to light up the wall behind it. So in most cases, you will not really see it at all. The bezels are fine, but they're not as thin as they look once you turn the monitor on. But what I really don't like is how much flex there is in the bottom bezel. I tried to quickly tilt the monitor down while I was using it. And even though there was not that much pressure on it, the display behind it was just completely bending. So you really need to be careful and make sure that you move the monitor with both hands. In terms of connections, you get one display port connection and two full bandwidth HDMI 2.1 connections. Uh, you also get a type C port with a 90 watt power delivery and a USB hub with the KVM switch feature. So you can connect your gaming PC, your Xbox and your PlayStation to it. And then you can swap to your work or school laptop with a single cable. So when it comes to connectivity, this monitor scores pretty high. Uh, they also included speakers, but like with most other monitors, they're not really that great. Uh, it is okay to have some basic sound for that incidental use, but I strongly suggest using a proper set of speakers or a proper headset instead. Now, Cooler Master is using a 27 inch IPS panel from AU Optronics, uh, the manufacturer that is behind many high end PC monitors. It is a regular 16 by 9 panel with a 4K resolution and it is flat, which kind of makes sense considering its size. 4K resolution on a 27 inch display looks extremely sharp, uh, which looks great in games, but it is even better for things like productivity or editing. Uh, considering it has mini LED backlight, to brightness should be pretty good. And when we look at the SDR mode, it only stands out a little bit with a peak brightness of 492 nits, which is still definitely more than average and more than enough for very bright rooms. But when you turn the HDR on, it can go extremely bright. I measured a peak brightness of just under 1400 nits, which is much more than most monitors can display and also way more than the 1200 nit claim that Cooler Master has in their marketing. Unfortunately, you cannot really see this in this video because my camera cannot just capture it properly. But to put things in perspective, 1400 nits is really bright and really hard to look at without squinting. But when used correctly for those highlighted details in the HDR content, having that extra brightness makes a huge difference. It gives you this fantastic effect that regular monitors just do not offer. 
It also manages to hold that extreme brightness when large parts of display or even the entire display shows white. So if you look at an HDR scene with big snowy mountains, for example, it's not going to drop the brightness due to power limits like an OLED panel would. And keep in mind, most typical OLED panels don't have higher peak brightness than 700 to 800 nits, with a full white screen being closer to 200 or 300 instead because of that power limitation. So mini LED technology manages this much better. Minimum brightness is at 64 nits, which isn't super dim, but it is still low enough for most users working in dark environments. When it comes to color, the color gamut is good as well. You get 99.8% of sRGB coverage, 97.4% of Adobe RGB coverage, and 96.1% of DCI-P3 coverage. So it's not quite 100%, but it can definitely display a wide range of colors, which is enough for a proper HDR experience, and it is still more than enough for proper photo and video editing work as well. Color calibration is a bit confusing though. Now on their product page, uh, Cooler Master isn't mentioning factory calibration at all, but in their pre-launch presentation, they did show a slide that mentions hand-tuned calibration. So I don't know if that is still happening because per unit calibration is pretty rare and it is totally possible they might have dropped this as a feature. Now there are several color profiles included and the default one uh, doesn't seem to be calibrated for any particular color space, nor is it oversaturated and aimed at gaming. The Adobe RGB profile shows a good gray balance, but some colors aren't as perfectly calibrated as I had hoped. A maximum of three delta E is usually a good goal here and some colors are a bit more off. The DCI-P3 profile is calibrated pretty well with an average delta E of 1.75 with some colors being off a bit more and it is pretty much the same for sRGB. It is mostly fine but there is still some room for improvement. So I think these results will be completely fine for most users out there but if your line of work requires more accuracy you will have to manually calibrate this monitor yourself. The uniformity, though, is surprisingly good, showing only minimal variations in brightness, white point, and color across different parts of the screen. So this is a result I would consider good for a productivity monitor, but for a gaming monitor, this is actually an excellent result. And since this is an IPS panel, it comes with the usual upsides and downsides of the IPS technology. The viewing angles are good and there's no real backlight bleed to speak of. A contrast, on the other hand, is just a weak point of IPS panels and if you don't turn local dimming on, the blacks just look gray. The local dimming backlight, however, does help significantly, so even if you turn that on low, the blacks will suddenly look great. And keep in mind, it does that in SDR mode as well, while some other monitors with local dimming will only do that in HDR content. So enabling local dimming puts the contrast more in line with the VA panel and then subjectively even better than that, but still it can really compete with an OLED panel when it comes to those perfect blacks. I think that 576 zones on a 27 inch panel managed to do a great job at improving the contrast and getting that HDR content looking great, but only if you're sitting directly in front of the panel. So if you look at the screen from an angle, uh, blooming does become more visible, especially with local dimming set to medium or to high. And I've seen some posts online that are reporting more blooming in general, but my sample right here simply doesn't have it as much, only when you look at it from a side, and even then I would call it moderately low. So this monitor really does fantastic when you're looking straight at it. So I think if you compare those downsides uh, against the fact that OLED panels are more expensive, they have a burn-in risk and they go way less bright than this, I do think that the GP27U really holds its own in HDR content. I just kind of wish it was a little bit bigger. But let's see how fast it is. Now when overdrive is off, it looks like a typical fast-ish IPS gaming monitor with a reasonable average initial response time of about five and a half milliseconds. 
but with overdrive on uh, that drops to a bit over 4.5 with some of the smaller transitions sitting closer to 2 to 3 milliseconds without showing any overshoot which is actually quite good Going to Overdrive Advance, uh, response times do improve by a bit with a little bit of overshoot being introduced, but this is also a very viable setting in my opinion. The only transition where it struggles with overshoot is going from uh, 255 to 204 RGB, which is uh, going from pure white to light gray, and I don't think that that is much of an issue because you will hardly ever see that. And in the highest ultra fast overdrive setting, it does show some transitions under one millisecond, which I'm sure is great for marketing. But considering the fact it shows a ton of overshoot in most transitions, you should just avoid this setting completely. I really do like that Cooler Master added a user adjustable overdrive mode, uh, similar to uh, what Eve Spectrum has. It lets you manually set the overdrive in steps from 0 to 100 to find your own ideal balance between response times and overshoot. And they also added a dynamic mode that will uh, swap between settings depending on the situation. And I think these are just great features if you have a bit of time to experiment and find a perfect setting for yourself. Otherwise, I would just stick to the normal or the advanced mode as both of those are completely fine. In terms of latency, the GP27U isn't the fastest monitor out there, which was expected since a mini LED monitor simply has more processing to do, so it's not going to compete with the PG27AQN in terms of competitive play, and it's a little bit behind a regular fast 4K monitor like the M32U or the EVE Spectrum. But the difference between them is not that big, so unless you use this for some extreme competitive play, this will not matter as much. The display is G-Sync compatible and Cooler Master said it has been sent to AMD for FreeSync Premium certification, but that hasn't been finalized just yet. Anyway, I had no issues with VRR in a couple of games I've tested this monitor with, and this is especially important for 4K monitors as they're not that easy to drive. So I've been testing it with the RTX 4090, but I still think a 3080 or an RX 6800 XT or a 6900 XT should be your minimum GPU targets for a monitor like this one. And even with those cards, you will benefit from the variable refresh rate in some of the heavier titles out there. If you're looking for power efficiency, a mini LED monitor might not be for you. For a regular 250-nit SDR image, this uses around 53 watts, which is a little bit more than a regular monitor would. But in HDR mode, this goes a little bit higher depending on the brightness of the content, uh, with a peak consumption of 115 watts when displaying a full white 1400-nit image. So. Yeah, keep that in mind, especially with the current electricity prices here in Europe. And I also wanted to talk about the OSD a bit, because this is where I think uh, Cooler Master can improve on. You can control it easily using the little joystick in the back, but the direction it goes to isn't always intuitive. Like, to accept the setting, you need to go to right. And some settings seem to be on or off, but that on off is actually related to another setting and I really don't like that it doesn't show which setting you're currently on. Now this is all forgivable in my opinion since Cooler Master is quite new to the monitor market but they can definitely use this feedback and just make it more user-friendly in the future. And aside from the OSD, uh, the fact that some color profiles could be calibrated a bit more and the bottom bezel being quite weak there is not much else I can complain about today. And I even think that they deserve uh, some praise for including options that many other monitors do not, like a user adjustable overdrive setting and like uh, letting you use the local dimming in SDR content, which kind of instantly fixes the contrast problems that other IPS panels have to deal with. Now, you do need a high power system to really benefit from a fast 4K gaming monitor. And while this is not a competitive esports monitor, it will give you a premium immersion gaming experience and an excellent HDR experience. Again, I just kind of wish there was a 32 inch version as well because 27 is on the small side for me personally, but a lot of people out there will appreciate 
this format. And let's not forget the price. So this should cost you $800 without taxes in the US or about 900 euros with taxes here in the Netherlands. And that is a great price for a monitor with these specs and with this performance. So fast mini LED 4K resolution monitors will usually cost you way more than this. And there are actually very few of those. And for this price, you could only get a lower resolution one or a slower 4K one. So Cooler Master set a truly competitive MSRP here. And now it's kind of up to them to make sure that that price stays and to make sure that this monitor is available because currently I cannot find it anywhere in stock. But if you are looking for a 27 inch fast 4K HDR monitor and you happen to find the GP27U in your region with this price tag, it is definitely worth grabbing it. That's all I have for today. Thank you for watching this video. And as always, if you don't want to miss any of my future uploads, please do click that subscribe button. Bye all and see you in the next one. Bye.